humans are the only species that purposefully deprives themselves of sleep. No other species does this. No other species does it because they know it's not good for them. If they do it, all of these things start happening, the same things that happen to us. So let's drop a little wax poetic to start this one, right? So uh, name this song. Mm. Sleep is the cousin of death. So my eyes wide open because my dream is good to my last breath. Biggie Smalls. Close. New York oriented. That was actually impressive. Okay. And wait, hold on. You're from New York, so you should definitely get this. I'm not that cool. Okay. Do you know? All right. So it is uh, Nas. And I think the song is called New York State of Mind, actually. Um, but we're back with another episode of Smarter Not Harder podcast. Your host, BTS, here. And we are on fire. Yes. That we're is supposed to know that reference, but we You're don't know. We're supposed to know the reference. Jesus. Like, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say that word here. Um, never mind. He was, a, he <laughs> was, he, he was Jewish. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, let's uh, skedaddle along. But, anyways, we're going to all listen to. Uh, k-pop music after this and familiarize ourselves but today i want to talk about sleep because unlike what nas suggested or the game or whoever or some former presidents who sleep four hours a night reportedly the um, or medical school students <laughs> or medical students investment bankers investment lawyers bank. a few others right uh, so sleep is an important topic and Indeed. if you uh, are one of those people who are fortunate enough to be able to sleep less than six hours, and I believe it's like 3% of the population. 1%. Maybe. 1%. Okay. Uh, then good for you. But for the rest of us, why is sleep important? I'm going to throw this up here. Like, uh, it's just sort of like a, a lob in volleyball. Somebody's got to spike this. Who wants to take this one first? I'll go first, and then I'm sure Ted can interject as needed. But so... Yeah, I was saying when I was in medical school, we used to wear these shirts that said sleep is for quitters. But believe me, it is not. <laughs> it's like that shirt that says, you know, your liver mu is evil, must be punished. And it's just, it's kind of a stupid shirt. You know, why humans do these things to ourselves? You know, we were just looking at something and reminding ourselves that humans are the only species that purposely deprives themselves of sleep. No other species does this. No other species does it because they know it's not good for them. If they do it, all of these things start happening, the same things that happen to us. We need our sleep for so many different things. Our immune system needs sleep. We have something called the lymphatic system in our brain, which is the lymphatic drainage of our brain that helps our brain detoxify at night. Without this happening, our brain starts building up with garbage and that garbage can't be cleared and we feel worse. We have personality changes. We die earlier. We have risks for things like schizophrenia and as such a compulsive disorder. And we have so many other things that Dr. Ted can take it away here. What do you want to say? Well, uh, Boomer started the lyrics of song and, you know, there's so many um, beautiful poetry around sleep. And I remember a line from Shakespeare to sleep for chance to dream. We're talking about REM sleep later, but uh, I love that he <laughs> references Shakespeare and I reference Nas or, or the game. <laughs> no. And, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Scott here said that we're the only species that actually deprive ourselves of sleep. And, you know, that reminded me, we're also the only species that are willing to die for our beliefs. So we're kind of stupid or idiotic that way as a species, but that's what we do, right? Um, and for uh, sleep, I, I was talking to Jack Cruz, uh, you know, love him or hate him. He's a fantastic guy, Maverick. Uh, he actually said, that you know ted don't you realize that sleep is uh, being asleep is probably the default of the body and if you take a look at evolutionarily really the uh the central nervous system sympathetic nervous system develop way later you know our central nerve our nervous systems develop way later and our default was actually you know go placidly amidst the noise and haste. Oh, well, I hope you got that reference. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, for those of us who didn't graduate by the time we were hitting puberty, what is that reference? It's please? from Desiderata, right? Of course, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, of course, read that five times. <laughs> well, it's go placidly amidst the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. Uh, people, you know, I, 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 
I think uh, I can do this with hip hop lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, uh, he, he that actually you know the the fact that he said like you know it actually set me to think well evolutionarily yeah you know um, the uh, nervous system is actually a late development in multicellular organisms, and uh, so. Uh, and and uh, that actually reminded me of a mattress advertisement when you guys were very young. It said, "I want one third of your life." Like truly, you know, <laughs> you know, um, uh, we actually sleep one third of our lives. In fact, one of the advice that I gave a college kid going a, a kid going to college for the first time, for which our parents were very grateful, is that divide your day in eights. You know, eight hours of sleep. You know. Uh, eight hours to study because you're going to college and and uh, eight hours to live right and and so uh, and so that's that's how important it is to us and we don't realize that right uh, and one of the things that uh, Jack was has been railing about is phototoxicity you know we invented light and as if we never needed to sleep ever again but we do all right so one of the objectives that I want to have with this episode is to talk a little bit about how to improve sleep and we can just kind of look at statistically and americans seem to be the easiest one to look at statistically i think it's americans sleep less than six hours a night on average yes and mm -hmm. so if we take that as kind of baseline that americans sleep less than six hours a night on average and scott already talked about one of the reasons or several of the reasons that we need a little bit more than that first maybe paint a picture of what is the objective goal here where do we want to be in terms of optimal sleep numbers you know maybe it's it's seven hours eight hours what does that mean in terms of lifespan and then we're going to get into more tactical things so uh, Scott I'm going to pass it to you talk a little bit about sleep duration where do we want to be yeah so this changes as we get older so when we start Get, when, we, when, when we're born, we need a lot more sleep. And that's why babies typically will go in about an hour and a half cycle. They'll sleep and then they'll need to eat because they don't have any reserves. They need to be up at an hour and a half or two hours to get fed again. But as we get older, those sleep cycles change. And as we're an adult, about the age of 18 or so, until the age of about 64, we have a pretty stable sleep architecture. And this typically means that we have more deep sleep in the early part of the evening and more REM sleep in the later part of the evening. And we have various hormones that regulate this. We have various things that doctors said that help regulate them as well, like seeing light, for example, first thing in the morning, or if we're seeing lights on our computer screens or our tablets this close to our heads before we go to bed, there's lots of things that can dysregulate this. But in general, that's your sleep architecture. You have four stages of non-REM sleep, or, and then this is one, two, three, and four. Three and four are your deeper stages. And you have REM sleep itself, which is your rapid eye movement sleep. This is when you're dreaming for the most part, although you do dream in non-REM sleep as well, just not as clearly and not as lucidly. And Dr. Tech can talk about his stage of lucid dreaming mastery as well. But that's the basics of it. And then we have a stable amount that we need somewhere on the hours between seven to nine hours. Some people can do well with seven. Some people can do well with eight. And some people actually need nine hours of sleep per night. And then the more active you are, so I have a lot of athletes that I work with, they need even more sleep than the average person because they need to recover more than the average person does. All right, so determining that optimal amount of sleep, sometimes that's difficult, and I would venture to guess that there's there's numerous ways that we can do this, right? There are maybe some things like, I don't know, can you go as far as a polysomnography test here? That's, that's the... That's the gold standard. So a polysomnography uh, test is when you go to a sleep lab. Does anybody <clears throat> sleep well in a sleep lab? That's the thing, right? So there's these home units now. They have home units that you can get that can do it in your own bed, and they can do polysomnography. So they're looking at brain waves. They're looking at oxygen levels, various other things, but those are the main things as well. So that's the standard of care, but there's lots of other ways that people are now tracking their sleep. And I think Boomer, you are the master of this to some degree as to all the various ways that people are doing this. And there are positive to these things and there are negatives to them, but they certainly can give you some metrics to work with. Yeah. When it comes to, uh, let's talk about things that don't cost any money first. Um, there are surveys online that you can of course get. And I cover this more in depth with a podcast I did with Greg Potter and we get a lot more academic in terms of how we approach this but one of them is the P pittsburgh sweep quality index and you can do this simple survey over a course of days and you can really understand a little bit more about the areas of sleep where you may need work 
Um, but my perhaps favorite way of doing this is with wearable technology. Now, wearables, uh, simply put, are just something that you put on your body that collects data um, or just a anything that you really use to collect data here. And um, I started this initially, this exploration with spreadsheets and trying to associate a correlation with um, alcohol and uh, self-described uh, self sleep quality, right? And so that generally worked for a little while and then the wearable technology got a little bit better. Things like, uh, if you remember, do you remember the, was it the Zio? Um, no. This was just an obnoxious device, which my, my um, it was beautiful in the sense that it, it worked really well, but it, it was a, essentially a headband that you would put on your head uh, and go to bed. My ex-girlfriend um, did, like, did not like this at all, um, but it was a did great way. Did it make way. funny noises? Um, <laughs> no, no. That was some of the refrigerated pads. That was your that girlfriend? You Sorry, <laughs> <bad joke. laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Bump shoot spike. All right. No, wait, actually, we I got to get a BTS reference in here. Mic drop. <laughs> um, all right, so that's another BTS song. Let's see how many more I can throw in here. All right, so going back to wearable technology, one of the other reasons that wearable technology uh, works is not necessarily because of the, the quality of the data. In fact, the quality of the data oftentimes is brought into question, but it does give you data relative to yourself. And so you can take this data over longer periods of time and compare yourself uh, and institute behavior changes. Does something like waking up, I know you mentioned already, uh, looking at light first in the morning, does that help you um, improve your circadian rhythms? Do you see results in uh, your uh, sweep quality as it's defined by Aura, Whoop, Apple Watch, whatever. And that relative data is actually very helpful um, in tracking over time because it, it's relative to you, right? And so even if it is not the highest quality data, it allows you to get some perspective at a relatively low cost. Yeah, and sometimes it's super easy. I mean, you just have to drink a couple of glasses of alcohol before you go to bed and you can see your your sleep score just go to shit in your deep sleep in particular yes. goes to nothing so back in the day when i used to have you know a couple of glasses of wine that you'd watch that deep sleep would go from my deep sleep now is greater than an hour or, or so uh but it would go to zero and this is something that would play through for a couple of days and maybe we just touch a little bit real quick on deep sleep why is it important yeah, so deep sleep is really important for a lot of different reasons. Um, we know that deep sleep is restorative sleep. So if you can get enough deep sleep, you're not going to feel rested the next day. Um, it also has multiple effects on your immune system. Ted, do you have anything that else to say about deep sleep? Um, actually, uh, deep sleep is where much of your memory consolidation occurs, right? Uh, although there are newer studies now as regards, you know, candles, uh, initial work on the hippocampal um, storage. Um, we know that uh, until now, it's not yet been disproven, that long-term memory storage actually occurs during deep sleep. So the, re uh, the more deep sleep you have, actually, the more long-term memory recall that you can actually make. Notice that if you deprive yourself of sleep, say you're cramming for an exam, that's all stored in your, in your uh, working memory. And then after the exam, you actually totally forget what you they are. You just described yeah. junior year of college for me. <laughs> yeah, <well>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess uh, there's some sort of like statute of limitations on that, right? So, okay, I think I, I'm well covered there. Um, before you guys proceed, I actually noticed something so, so delightful that's happened here. These guys are my students, and you notice know, that at the beginning, they just introduced sleep, the general concept of sleep, and then they proceeded immediately to the detection methods. Like, these are what you can use to detect polysomnography, gadgets, devices, and watch. The next is how do you correct for uh, this uh, deficiencies in sleep? This is so fucking wonderful. So I, I wasn't going to give the complete outline, but thank you for spoiling it. <laughs> um, so uh, going no. back to wearables, these surveys, everything, uh, what or even data, if you go and get a polysomnography test, metabolomics, et cetera, what does data do? It helps bring awareness to where you are at this moment. And so you have your awareness now, and or Ted likes to say, the detection component. Now, let's get into some of these correction well, things. Well, before we get there, I think oh, it's also Jesus, important. Oh, Jesus, we're that, going to Yeah, I think we're going to go. Just one more thing here. I think because I think it's important that you can actually look at data. We look at metabolomic data uh, as health optimization medicine practitioners, and we can actually see what's happening. You can look at 
metabolites of something like serotonin or norepinephrine or dopamine. You can look at oxidative stress markers. You can look at vitamins, minerals, and cofactors, amino acids, all these things that have a significant effect on your sleep quality and quantity as well. And if you have the money to get a cytokine panel, you will see because la the sleep deprivation activates a pathway, a transcription factor called, called NF-kappa B that will increase uh, the level of your pro-inflammatory cytokines, really causing total body inflammation, not just of you know, your brain, but of all of your body. And that's why when you lack sleep, you know, you gain weight, you have all of these things that are actually do to total body inflammation. And blood sugar, right? And yeah, so, for sure. And so, so there are a number of different metabolites, biomarkers that we can also throw into the mix in terms of the detection side of things. Uh, let's get into correction, and I want to start with um, Mr. Cruz's favorite topic, which is light. Uh, when we're talking about light, Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, I shouldn't say call him Doctor. Yeah, Doctor, <laughs> definitely Doctor. He Cruz. might be listening. Uh, and so, Doctor Cruz is uh, one of his favorite tools in his toolkit. I mean, he light, water, magnetism, always, but light how why is light such a, a key factor in really um, synchronizing circadian rhythm yes yeah, so uh, dr cruz is is fantastic on this topic and he had a great conversation with ted he's had multiple conversations with other practitioners other podcasters including our friend dr ed caddy actually right recently as well who's in a, another health optimization practitioner and the key with light is it resets circa, uh, circadian rhythms. It goes into something called your suprachiasmatic chiasmatic nucleus in your brain. And then it all these various effects on various genes and various modulators of all these different clocks that we have in our body. Um, all of our organs have different clocks and all of them get synchronized by the sun. Um, if you take a look at it uh, also from the, from the endocrine perspective, when we were intended to wake up with the sun and when light hits your skin, uh, actually your uh, cortisol levels begin to rise and your thyroid levels begin to rise because that's what wakes you up ready for the day, right? That's a little, paras uh, a little sympathetic stimulation for you to get up and go. And, uh, and when the sunlight hits, hits your skin, it also activates one of Dr. Cruz's favorite molecules, which, which is POMC or pro-opium melanocortin. But I leave you guys to Google search that. Um, but from his point of view, which is uh, actually a little bit you know, a, a farther perspective, but actually a good perspective is that, is that, that we actually eat in order to gather electrons. And, you know, light is actually electrons. So he looks at the body more as an uh, essentially a pathway for electrons to get through. And that's why he is very, very particular about light, water, and magnetism. Okay, keep the mic because I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Okay, okay. and uh, you might not be ready for this. This is a big one. Okay. Okay. Um, we're talking about correction here, and one of the things that um, I've come to know you for is Dr. Ted's sleep anchoring technique. What the fuck is that? Well, most people actually uh, regard sleep as the last activity of the day, and therefore they, they can't finish what they're doing, or they can't uh, they can finish their work, or what they're watching on TV, etc they will skimp on their sleep and then still wake up at their regular time. And therefore, sleep is really uh, the activity that suffers the most. So uh, the sleep actor anchoring technique is really very easy. It's you have to anchor your sleep, you know, at the time at night where you say you're going to sleep and make that or mark that, and this is the important part of it, as your first activity of the day. Being the first activity of the day is your most important and therefore you're less likely to skimp on it. And then you base your schedule based on that first activity, which is sleep, then wake up and then plan your activities. When it's time to sleep again, whatever it is you're doing, you stop. That's the sleep anchoring technique. Okay, that seems really easy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm joking, sarcasm, uh, but uh, all right. So we have the sleep anchoring technique, and that's certainly a great way to learn to prioritize sleep. Let's talk about some of the other tactics. Now, all, all of us here have worked with people. You guys are, are medical doctors and see this often, but let's talk about other tactics and maybe some simple behavior changes before we get into molecular uh, level or sorry, uh, supplements that we may recommend. But let's talk about simple behavior changes that you may see that work frequently with your clients? Yeah, one of the things that I really work on with clients is a sleep routine. So just like Ted's talking about a sleep anchoring technique at time, 
about 15 to 30 minutes before you go to bed, ideally even longer than that if you can, your number one, you're off screens. Uh, that's for sure. You get, you get no blue light, even if you're wearing blue blockers and doing all those things, you still don't Is want- Is there an exception here for Excel spreadsheets or no? Only because you orgasm over them. Okay. Only because you orgasm and over them. Orgasming there. does help with sleep. I don't know, does it? I think Amy has clear um, people. Um, orgasm doesn't, ejaculation does. Ejaculation Because it sleep. induces prolactin to rise, ah. right? Kind of like a postprandial tide, you know, of prolactin. So that's also the same. So thing. prolactin goes up and then sleep improves sleep, as a result yeah, of yeah, ejaculation. Yeah, yeah. So you just, I mean, Scott's now going to have 10,000 more kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> no more children. I have four. That's enough. They're beautiful. I love them. So from a sleep routine perspective, Try to do the same thing every night when you go to bed. And that doesn't, really doesn't matter what that is in general, but it should be something that's more parasympathetic in nature. So mild stretching, uh, I go in my infrared sauna, uh, getting, uh, just getting calm and whatever that is, if you do it the same way every night or most nights, your body's going to be like Pavlov's dog, the dog that salivated when a bell rang when there was food, but then when the bell rang when there was no food, it was still salivating. It's the same thing. Your body's going to be salivating for sleep, if that makes sense. It's kind of weird. Do you, but do you, yeah, do you salivate for sleep? I don't salivate for sleep, <laughs> but maybe I will start. I mean, okay. <laughs> Well, uh, we'll include uh, a, a sort of small YouTube short about Scott salivating for sleep. Um, when, you know, since high school, I had this routine that was labeled BSR, and it's before sleep routine, and I actually already have increased it. For my patients, what I do is to tell them about the sleep anchoring technique, and I say, is very simply, one line, your day begins at the time you sleep. When you tell them that, it sort of like flips there, like, oh, why not? Yeah, you know, so you complete the activity. But I also tell them a few behavioral modifications, like no, um, uh, uh, nothing that is gonna uh, rev up your sympathetic nervous system, like stimulants, like coffee, you know, 14 hours before your bedtime. So 14 me, hours? Yeah, for me, it's like two o'clock in the afternoon, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, I tell them, uh, to uh, their last meal, you know, they should sleep um, after three hours of their last meal, three or more hours after their last meal. And that's because the gastric emptying time is actually about on the average three hours, right? So you don't want the, your stomach to be holding food. You know, your intestines should be, should be uh, digesting, at the, uh, should be the one uh, digesting and absorbing at the time and not uh, getting held in your stomach. In fact, that's a common cause of GERD, right? Uh, if you just correct that, then actually, uh, you know, minor GERD uh, goes away. And um, uh, and then uh, I also tell them, uh, you know, to actually remind them that they, themselves that they're about to sleep about two hours before they should already be relaxing. If, for example, you're watching a horror movie or watching something that will make your heart pump, well, you know, that's going to affect your sleep because you won't be able to sleep. You know, you have your adrenaline pumping in your system and uh, that, that, that actually fucks up your sleep. The other thing that, you know, uh, this... Uh, uh, companies have done is actually make you know you, the series that you're watching so addicting that their the cliffhangers are just like you want to see the next and and therefore you need to have the discipline to actually throw away the clicker and say you're not watching what's the, the next. most addictive show you've ever watched oh um i think um korean uh uh uh, you know, series are actually quite addicting because the format is so ADHD type, right? Did you just do that because you're bringing it back to BTS? Yes. That's pretty, that's pretty yes, cute. Yes. So it's interesting because as a person who's watched some Korean dramas, there is a story arc to this and a lot of it follows Romeo and Juliet, but they make it more and more addicting than Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, BTS and uh, <laughs> probably, uh, but there's uh, recovery forums online. So if you have issues with Korean drama and staying up late at night for it, uh, there are um, recovery sites, so people who are recovering from addictions to Korean drama. Anyway, back to our, our regular scheduled programming. <laughs> uh, we were talking a little bit about sleep and behavior changes. Um, keep going. Yeah. The, the other thing is I do ask them to tape all the LED lights in the room. You sleep in a totally dark room, right? And set your, your temperature cool enough, like 68 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, for me, 70. Um, and, and, and that's good enough because, uh, you know, your body, uh, you, you know, you, if it's too warm, you're, you're, you will wake up, right? But uh, of, of course, be mindful that around four o'clock in the morning, your body is also, body temperature also drops, right? So make sure 
sure that you have the appropriate blanket in there and your blood glucose also drops. Uh, the, uh, and we know that, for example, your carbohydrate stores that are in your liver, you have about 100 grams in your liver, you know, when, when, you, when you sleep and that, that glucose actually keeps you alive, you know, and then in the morning, 80 grams is used up, you all actually have 20 grams left. So an advice that I also give patients, if they wake up and they have and and they can do a brisk walk of about 40 minutes you know uh, when they wake up they use up that uh, 20 grams of, of of glucose and then they shift to a ketone metabolism and then the fat burning mode goes on so so a couple of other things that i want to add to that because this is this is a really cool conversation um on the theme of light here uh, one area and this is a particular issue in hotels is making sure that you have blackout blinds right, right. because things like street light and i know you talked about covering lights within mm. the room and uh you know as we travel i tend to throw shirts all over the the crazy lighting situation that we have but blackout blinds is very very important uh, when it comes to temperature we already talked about that you said 68 degrees i'm yeah. more like a 65 kind of guy but it's uh, becoming lower and lower <laughs> yeah you're uh, i just i just keep going lower and lower but What's an interesting, and this is where kind of the tools and tech come in, uh, what's an interesting way to do this if your partner is more um, susceptible to uh, wanting to be warm rather than cold, you can have a, a, a pad, and there's a couple of companies out there, you can find them on the internet really easily, which you can temperature control different sides of the mattress um, in order to really optimize your sleep based on what you prefer. Um, the other thing is in sleeping with partners, I, I do find uh, if your partner snores, maybe maybe you need another partner. Um, <laughs> 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 or uh, I, I guess it just... Sleep divorce. Uh, just yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a sleep divorce. Yeah. Resolution. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we know of several professional athletes, actually, that do this, right? They go to sleep in different rooms. I think we even were talking about a, a singer, relatively famous sleep singer that sleeps in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber um, and... Uh, how he sleeps separately. I don't know if they do that together. I do they? they have two separate chambers for their? I think they have two separate chambers for each other. That's what I heard. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, that would really bring about the mild deep club if uh, yeah. if, <laughs> if if it was uh, something that happened together. Anyway, um, so there are different methods of dealing with uh, difficult partners, and one of the things that I'm going to tee up here is Dr. Ted. What's your favorite detox? Being away from you guys. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was actually looking for Dr. Ted's favorite detox or best detox is <laughs> divorce, and this actually this actually might work if your partner is not a very good sleeper. Um, I, you know, um, I actually something something came up, and I think I've mentioned these studies uh, a few times uh, when I've lectured. It's like I really read this beautiful study where they did an you know um, uh, intravenous uh, uh, measurement of uh, cortisol levels of two partners. One was snoring a snorer, and the other was not a snorer. And each time the um, uh, each time there was a snoring sound, they would see the cortisol spike and then go down again. So for each saw that comes out, so the cortisol is also going like a saw like this, and it was like. <laughs> You know, this is the reason for sleep divorce. You know, I, you, you really have to be kind to yourself, uh, especially it's because sleep is really the most rejuvena rejuvenative act that you could ever do for yourself. Um, one of the other issues or things I want to talk about was uh, for people that have stress related sleep issues and maybe this leads to conditions like insomnia, but the value of journaling. Right. And so before you go to bed, writing down everything that's on your mind, putting it beside your bed, uh, just a way of getting it out of your head. But also and I do think we discussed this in another podcast with Greg. But if you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a tendency not to get back to sleep, writing down in that journal uh anything that's going on in your head so that you have it there in the morning. It allows your brain to at least relax a little bit and hopefully you get back to sleep. I just want to add on the partner side of things. Uh, one thing that was recommended to me when I got married was try not to go to bed angry because that's not going to be helpful for your sleep. So try to resolve things before you go to bed as much as you can with your kids, with your partners, uh, with your dog, whatever it might be, and try to have a relaxing bedtime routine, including that with your partner. But if you do have a snoring partner or if you are snoring yourself, you really need to get checked to make sure you don't have sleep apnea. We know that about two-thirds of Americans are obese and the morbid, morbid obesity rate is going up skyrocketing. So if you have a thick neck, even if you're not that big of a person, 
even if you have a thick neck and you're sleeping, you might still have sleep apnea. So I would get checked out. You can go to a sleep lab. It's not the best like we were talking about, but it does help. You can get a sense or you can get a home test as well. But no matter what we do from a detection perspective or a correction perspective, as we'll talk about, very little else is going to fix sleep apnea other than either losing weight or getting a sleep machine or a sleep appliance to help you. Marriage advice by Dr. Scott Sure, You all got right. it. So, I got more. Um, <laughs> it's not all that good, but I can do it. <laughs> uh, let's talk about ways to, uh, I guess, supplements and maybe potential uh, different compounds that we can use to address sleep. A uh, very popular one out there, of course, is, um, and I'm sitting between two people, one of which it works for and the other one it doesn't, uh, melatonin. And, uh, you know, everyone, when you think of sleep, you immediately race towards melatonin. And I'm going to throw it up there and see who grabs it first. Uh, let's talk about melatonin here. Well, before I talk about melatonin, there's something that you said about journaling. People usually ask me, you know, um, about their sleep cycles. And in order to find out your sleep cycle, it's, you know, useful to have a journal because uh, the average sleep cycle for the person is about 90 minutes or so. And 90 minutes, you get either four of that a night or five of that a night, amounting to about, you know, seven hours and 30 minutes of sleep. And in between those, it's a period of very light sleep where you're likely to wake up. And when you wake up, you know, just note the time and and take a look at the average so you know what your average sleeps or what your sleep cycle really looks like you know mine is very average it's at 90 minutes so uh you know if you have to set your alarm set your alarm at the time that the, your actually cycle is finished like for example you have an appointment at uh, at seven right you know you set your alarm at six you know because uh, the next cycle will be from six to seven thirty it's an hour and 30 minutes if you wake up in the middle of a cycle, then you'll feel like you've been hit by a Mack truck and that you never, you, it's very hard for you to wake up and you'll have a horrible day. So, um, that's, you know, uh, that's the, uh, advice that I could give and especially use, uh, useful when you want to journal, uh, is the time for, for finding out your sleep cycle. Now to the, um, subject of, uh, melatonin, melatonin actually is a signal for your body to rest. It's actually produced when everything is totally dark. It's natural, right? When um, you know, when we did not invent electricity yet, uh, and you know everything went dark, you know the melatonin production actually slowly increased in the brain, right? And for those of you who have tried a uh, very high dose melatonin, like I have, you know, to see what sort of dose would work for me, you see that if you actually take a very high dose of melatonin, you will have very vivid dreams but very short sleep. Like uh, you get about four hours of sleep, but you'll wake up refreshed. But, you know, uh, people uh, actually complain that they have nightmares. And so I actually am one of the people who actually enjoy nightmares because I know that I'm having a REM sleep. So, um, uh, but. And you, you can control your nightmares. So yeah, I can control my nightmares. Lucy Dreamer number three. Yeah, Stage I, three? Is that what it's uh, yeah. Level, level. level three. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, there are three levels of lucid dreaming, right? One is you're waking up in your sleep. The second one is you can fly in your sleep. You can control your action. The third one is you can change your environment. And what I do is when I'm having my melatonin nightmares is, you know, I go and chase the monster and hug the monster. And, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's, really, it's really something else, a, a different experience altogether. But melatonin is Sorry, actually, let me interrupt you real quick because there's somebody listening to this. I'm guaranteeing that there's somebody in the billion people that are on YouTube that is probably listening to this and saying, did Dr. Ted just endorse high-dose melatonin and being able to get four <laughs> hours of sleep for the rest of my life? No, no, no. That was me experimenting on what dose was actually uh, good for me. Uh, and by high, I don't mean, you know, 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams. By high, I mean like 10. So <laughs> that, that's buy that over the counter. Here. That, that, that's what I mean. Um, but, you know, very high doses like 50 to 80 milligrams can be actually used clinically, not for sleep, but to prevent the cells from actually uh, killing themselves or what's called a uh, process called apoptosis because um, a melatonin, w melatonin would prevent uh, the signal that's produced by caspase 9, right? Caspase 9 comes out of the cell and says, oh, destroy this cell. You know, it's ready to die and let's recycle what it, it has. But melatonin will stop that. And, the, and so it's very useful, for example, for high dose melatonin is very useful for decreasing the amount of infarct in, uh, in, uh, in heart attacks, for example. It's never used, but there are papers that are actually support this that say it actually decreases the the uh, size of the infarct because it prevents the cells from dying. Okay, so after melatonin and um, 
we didn't really touch on on sort of some other experience with melatonin, but in the interest of time, uh, let's talk about some other supplements that may work on uh, on sleep. And one of uh, your favorite topics, Dr. Scott, is GABA. And specifically, let's go a little bit into how we might manipulate uh, GABA production and why we may not may want to manipulate GABA production in the brain. Yeah, so GABA is our inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it helps us calm down the firing of our brain, which is really important when we're sleeping. We need to have a main maintenance level of GABA throughout the evening, so when Dr. Ched's chasing around monsters, he doesn't actually wake up. It's just him having REM sleep, because what happens during REM is that we get very active. If you look at our brain waves during REM, they're very active. It looks like we're awake. And why we're not awake actually is because majority is because of GABA, also from serotonin as well, but certainly GABA is a part of it. So for a lot of people, they are GABA deficient. They don't have the cofactors that are required to make the transition from something called glutamate, which is an, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, to GABA. And there's the balance of those two. And if you're more majority glutamate, you're gonna be more awake and more irritable. If you're more GABA, you're gonna be more relaxed and more calm. So one of the things that, that I think about a lot in my patients and clients is how I can modulate the GABA system in a way so that they have a long-term capacity to keep that GABA system up. And the first way, and the first thing that we do as health optimization practitioners is optimize their metabolome and looking at vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, including things like glutamine, which is an amino acid that turns into glutamate in the brain, and then glutamate again turns into GABA, but also vitamin B6, magnesium. We also know that if you're stressed all the time, you're gonna deplete magnesium. If you have a lot of inflammation, so you're, sorry, you're gonna deplete GABA. If you're, if you're, um, if you are, inflamed as well, you're gonna have less GABA production. So there's lots of things that go in to GABA production and it's really important to look at that from the cellular level. And there are compounds and supplements that we can use to help that too. Um, for supplementation, it's actually useful to think about what actually induces sleep, right? So uh, well, the way I think about it is not immediately supplementation because the first thing that you need to have is a sleep drive or desire to sleep. You must feel tired, right? So exercise is really a good prescription uh, for anyone who wishes to have a, a good sleep, you know, um, uh, having a decent amount of exercise in the day increases the adenosine in your body. And, and what's adenosine for those who are not familiar? Uh, adenosine is actually uh, part of uh, uh, nucleotides. You know, um, they're used to build your, your DNA, etc. But on their own, adenosine is actually also uh, used in the molecule uh, that produces energy. There is adenosine diphosphate, adenosine uh, triphosphate. And during the day, of course, you use up your adenosine triphosphate, right? And then what's left would be a very, very high adenosine level. And that actually tires out your body. It says, oh, okay, you know, you have no more uh, energy currency, so you feel tired. So, you know, and exercise is one of the ways to uh, increase that. Uh, adenosine, the sleep drive. And then the second one is, you know, you remember that your body needs to get, yeah, by the way, as Scott mentioned earlier, caffeine would actually displace adenosine from the receptor and therefore will wake you up again. And that's why you don't want stimulants, right, uh, um, before sleeping. And then um, uh, the next way to think about it is like, oh, I need to signal my body to sleep now. That's when you actually, you know, turn down the lights or, you know, have your blue blockers or whatever. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, it, you know, uh, you you tape out the LED lights, etc. The reason for that is actually melatonin actually rises only in a completely dark space, right? Any light, any uh, amount of light will actually start decreasing uh, or degrading melatonin right away. And then after that, you need to induce sleep, right? So like, okay, you know, I'm gonna turn turn. So uh, things like you know magnolia bark, for example, or valerianic acid from a valerian root. These are very good inducers uh, of of sleep. You know, they'll make you fall asleep, but they will not uh, actually maintain your sleep. Right. And then after that, you think about, you know, what would actually be promoting the sleep as GABA, as uh, Scott said. So honokyl itself is a positive allocytic modulator of GABA. Uh, there are uh, substances like agarin, for example, that can actually act like GABA within within the cell. And, you, the, the, you know, there's a calm and peacefulness uh, during the sleep. Uh, you know, if you're anxious, actually, it's hard to sleep, right? If you're, for example, anxious about an exam tomorrow, an interview tomorrow, then that actually maintains the uh, anti-anxiousness uh, portion. And then you have, and then after that, you think about... Before, there's yeah. one thing that you didn't mention there, okay. which I think is important to raise. 
Uh, you didn't mention GABA supplements, so what's the issue with supplementing with GABA in general? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, uh, GABA is a very big molecule and it's notoriously uh, known not to cross the blood-brain barrier. So um, either what you do uh, is either you complex it with vitamin B3, right? Uh, a, a vitamin B3, and the, if you touch them to B3 to GABA, then vitamin B3 uh, actually crosses the blood-brain barrier. It can pull the GABA inside. Inside the brain, it will hydrolyze into GABA and vitamin B3. That's why that particular uh, compound actually is a paradoxic effect. There's a level by which it actually induces um, uh, calm in you, but any higher, the B3 will take over and, you know, uh, it activates your brain. So, and the other way is actually to give a molecule that quacks like GABA, but isn't GABA, you know, and one of those uh, molecules is like agarin, for example, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it's a smaller molecule, and it binds to the GABA receptor itself. And so having the GABA, and uh, having a uh, uh, ligand at the at the actual GABA receptor and then having a positive uh, Alzheimer's modulator, you actually can expect to have a good sleep, you know, to, to do that. Then after that, you have you have a problem of maintaining sleep, right? Uh, maintaining sleep is usually done by giving you like uh, something like 5-HTP, right? Uh, uh, and 5-HTP actually is actually a, pr uh, a precursor to serotonin, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when you when you when you do that, then usually you don't you don't get, um, you know, when you wake up, you are able to sleep uh, right away. And, you know, there are also cannabinoids like, uh, you know, CBD and CBN, which are known to actually be beneficial for sleep. Via many properties, one, it has anti-inflammatory properties, but they have also some stoning properties, like they, they actually uh, uh, put your body at rest. Okay, well, we just went through a laundry list of different ingredients there <laughs> and different su uh, different supplements that one can take for what I love about Ted's brain is you basically just took us end to end for sleep and sort of what benefits it. And I think Scott's here to tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so uh, the Ted created a really great framework for th everybody to think about how many different aspects of sleep there are. And one of the things we do also look at is slow wave sleep or deep sleep. And there's another ingredient that we've been looking at uh, called cordyceps. And, this and is just cordyceps, to be f sure here, we're not talking about the cordyceps mushroom, which took over the world in Last of Us. Yes, yeah, so The Last of Us is on HBO, and it talks about the cordyceps mushroom, which takes over, creates zombies. It does create zombie ants, that is true. We are using the active form of cord or the, one of the active ingredients in cordyceps. In co it's called cordyceps. It's a fantastic molecule. And it helps with slow wave sleep, which is your deep sleep, your stage three and four sleep. And it's a fantastic molecule or compound. And it also has metabolic effects. It looks like it has potential at some doses, anti-cancer effects, immunologic effects. It improves insulin resistance and multiple other things as well. So it's another m compound that you could potentially use to help optimize your sleep cycles and sleep framework. Yeah, I have uh, taken a look at a hard and fast a hard and slow look, not a fast look at cordyceps, and, and the studies on a uh, deep sleep are actually quite fascinating. I didn't expect. See, it it's actually like it's like adenosine, right? And people were suspecting that it converted to adenosine, but actually, it seems to act by a different pathway in 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 um, in uh, creating uh, um, longer uh, deep sleep and. Just as you know, a scientist suspecting something, I, I think it's converted to adenosine much later in your uh, phase of sleep. That's why instead of adenosine just increasing, increasing sleep drive, when it converts to adenosine finally in the brain, when you are already asleep, I think it promotes deep sleep. Well, that's just a hypothesis. It still needs to be proven. And maybe we'll we'll look at that someday. Uh, okay, I want to round out this conversation because this has obviously been fantastic. We've talked about detection. We've talked about correction. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We've even talked about molecules uh, and supplements that you can take to address different elements of sleep. If you were to give one tip uh, to anybody listening to this in terms of optimizing their sleep, Maybe something to look at. Maybe uh, your favorite molecule uh, or supplement to take. Uh, what would you go with, and why? Hmm. Don't all jump at once. Um, I would look at my most favorite stressor, and take it away. Um, 
be it my job, my partner, or whatever it is that ails you, that actually prevents you because your mind goes round and round that particular issue over and over. Well, you know, that's stressing you out and stress will actually um, uh, give you poor sleep. And that can persist for months, years, you know, depending on, uh, depending on your tenacity to hold on to the situation. That reminds me of an interesting exercise that I used to do, which was like you list your, your stressors, and I did this probably 10 years ago, but you list your top stressors and you do your best to eliminate sort of the, the top three, if you will. And sometimes those are people, uh, sometimes they're a job, and sometimes it's a relationship, as you alluded to, and it's beautiful. Yeah, I think one of the things that Dr. Said, Dr. Ted said earlier was the sleep anchoring technique, and that's been transformative for me personally, and also I think uh, the clients that I work with as I've now given that advice to them as well. So if we can remember your day starts when you go to bed rather than when you wake up, it's just a huge shift in perspective. So that's probably the, the number one thing that I tell my patients and clients. All right, Scott, I'm going to shout out to you on this one because I think you mentioned it. Ted might have said it as well. But... Um, just mine is the stopping your your work uh, and giving yourself a gap before bed right so that transition into your evening give yourself a decent amount of time and i know personally i think there's there's actually like two things that i've measured over periods of time that really affect my sleep and how my day goes the next uh, the next day and one of those is stopping work at least an hour before bedtime and i think frankly i could do better and increase that more and improve my sleep more but i know that works well in others too yeah yeah i mean from a supplement perspective i mean we have many here at transcriptions as many listening will, will likely know and they work in different ways and we have something called TroZ that's just come out recently when this podcast comes out and look it's a it's a transformative complete sleep solution many of the ingredients that we've been talking about today are in there and we know it works, we've been testing it, we've been getting fantastic stories so far, and we feel like this is gonna be transformative for so many people, and we're just really excited about it. I think you guys would agree. Yeah, and we address, as Ted alluded to, all aspects of sleep issues with Trozy. So regardless if you have issues staying asleep, like I do, or have issues falling asleep, like uh, I do, or waking up during the day, we address all of that, and that's really what Trozy brings to the table. In the future, we may take it and break it down into individual issues but for now uh, we've got the whole sleep solution yeah and then trocom is great if you have uh, anxiousness or stress too um, winding down in the e in the evening before bed instead of a glass of wine my jam yeah wine or no no no, no. <laughs> sorry that was an interesting <laughs> interjection there right uh, so actually trocom is one of the ways i was able to give up alcohol that's right, probably right. a subject for another episode but right, right. Yeah. we'll we'll get there at some point yeah so i mean description it's like a bo one bottle of beer. Uh, yeah, so it's the one beer effect, right? And so for those of us who have drank in the past um, and want to just relax in the evening, the, the one beer effect, so how do you get that ah? Uh, um, which I think you've described enlightenment to me as that relaxed feeling of ah and the lazy boy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but also how do you produce that uh, molecularly? Um, Trocom does that. Yeah, I mean, I think every supplement that you could potentially use has a purpose and we think that Trozy is your complete sleep solution in this case but we hope that you know, as health optimization practitioners and docs here our hope is that you can find these sleep techniques that we're discussing here without any supplements without any drugs only when you need them and then truly get a, a sleep routine and a sleep schedule that works for you without that stuff but all of us travel you know we're in a, in a hotel room as you guys can see here you know it's not easy when you travel like <laughs> it's not easy to change time zones. It's not easy to eat the foods that you don't typically eat. It's not easy to be around two guys that be sarcastic, are always sarcastic and, and joke and make me feel bad. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're changing this into a psychology show. Okay, um, I mean, just round off with final Oh, thoughts. we love you, Scott. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, when you're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any final thoughts, Dr. Todd? Um, yes, I actually got an interesting question um, at the conference where um, they asked me about, you know, um, what about the chronotypes, right? Well, generally, we have only two accepted chronotypes, really, uh, which is the lark and the owl, right, the night owl. And however, you know, um, Dr. Bruce uh, actually has, you know, the dolphin, the bear, the lion, uh, the lion you know, the jaguar. And 
the question was, you know, uh, should we believe in those? And I said, you know, these chronotypes can change, right? Uh, they can change uh, depending on your age and your uh, your, uh, your stage in life, your job, etc. I used to be, you know, uh, be, when I before I became a medical student, I used to be just really a bear you know wake up in the sun would go down i would sleep in the sun uh, um, when the sun um, was down um uh, and and then when in med school when you're actually forced to uh you know uh, deal with uh, patient in intensive care in the middle of night you know and you get waken up in the middle of your REM sleep at like, persistently and consistently when you're on duty you know i change into a dolphin which is like you know, dolphins sleep with the one eye open, the, you know, their half of the brain sleep and the other one is alert because they're sentinels, right? They sense, they're basically sensing danger all the time. And that's uh, what my chronotype changed to. And uh, from current studies, you know, it's very hard to shift from that chronotype, you know, um, for, for a long time until you again um, uh, take on a job or um, uh, a lifestyle that is then suited now for another chronotype. So, uh, you know, if, if you guys, you know, don't obsess about the chronotype that you have, you know, they're, they're uh, likely to change just like they discovered, you know, they, your, your personality tests, their, your personality can change over time. So these are very dynamic things and, you know, uh, don't box yourself into any one of them. Just notice what you are like now and you're probably what we're likely uh, going to be and then uh, what you likely are and then, you know, just see uh, whether or not that that really, really works for you. Well, that was dynamite. So let's sign off now. Thank you to everybody who's uh, uh, listening to this podcast. By the way, that was the third BTS reference uh, today. And thank you. Me. Yeah, it was dynamite. Um, it, I think at one point that was the number one most watched song on YouTube. I don't know if that's still true. But anyways, uh, this podcast has been dynamite. And once again, to everybody listening, stay equanimous. Yeah.